Welcome back. In this subsection, we discuss what different types of ASICs are and what they aren't. So ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. And that's exactly what it means, a chip designed to form a particular application. This is opposed to general purpose circuits such as central processing units, graphics processing units and memories. An ASIC is generally not software programmable to form a wide variety of tasks, though they often have an embedded CPU to manage tasks that are suitable to software. An ASIC may be implemented as a field programmable gate array, which we'll get to, to later, but this is often considered a separate category than standard cell ASICs, uh, which again we'll get to in a few moments. So what ASICs aren't are general purpose integrated circuits. Uh, examples of these include programmable microprocessors, such as the Intel processors, ARM, M9, Motorola embedded processor, etc. These, these sorts of general purpose processors power everything from uh, washing machines to supercomputers. Another class of general purpose IC are uh, programmable DSP engines, or digital signal processors such as the TI TMS430 series. These are suited for signal processing tasks, such as multimedia applications, sensor processing, and sometimes communications. Another example of a general purpose integrated circuit is a graphics computation unit, or GPU. Uh, these are very good at parallel arithmetic. Memories also serve as a, a very broad category of general purpose integrated circuits. Uh, such as volatile memory, such as dynamic RAM or static RAM, and non-volatile memory, such as flash, uh, phase control, phase change memory, etc. We'll return to memories in uh, the last in a later module in this course. Here's some examples of ASICs. Uh, your set-top box uh, has a video processor in it that's designed to decode and encode uh, digital TV signals. Uh, your video camera has uh, a similar unit. Your cell phone has a ASIC on the central processor, which is a dedicated video processor. Some fixed function graphics processors are also ASICs, but these are generally replaced by GPUs today. Uh, Dedicated units for particular functions, such as a, a signal processing of a particular nature, or a codec, a encoder and decoder. Uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, the uh, the 5G codec in your cell phone uh, is is an ASIC or built as an ASIC. Encryption processors for security are also might be part of a larger chip, but built as ASICs. An increasingly uh, common ASIC is an artificial intelligence accelerator, an accelerator designed to speed up and reduce the power consumption of an inference engine. Uh, Bitcoin miners, which uh, use hash function solvers, are, example, are built as ASICs. And furthermore, just to confuse things a little bit, most general purpose chips are designed using an ASIC methodology. That is, they're written, they're, they're designed using register transfer language, which we'll get to later in this course. And the same sorts of tools, same sorts of CAD tools that are used for dedicated ASICs are also used to implement CPUs and GPUs. In general, a hardware implementation of a particular function outperforms a software implementation on a general purpose processor by many orders of magnitude. Uh, in terms of performance, power, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, but it does require a lot of engineering talent uh, to design an ASIC, whereas writing software is a much more common skill and cheaper to execute. So let's turn now to some of the different types of ASICs, some, including some of the less common ones. One of the less common ones is a full custom ASIC. That is, every transistor is designed and drawn by humans. Uh, today, this is typically only used to design analog and ultra high speed portions of ASICs. It does give the highest performance, but has a long design time. 
and we'll talk about fabrication in a few moments, but it leads to a full set of masks required for fabrication. So here's an example of an encryption processor that was designed by my group in the 1990s before RTL methodologies were commonplace. It's a full custom ASIC. Um, and you, know, you can see here, this is it's ranged, it's ranged into a, a set of identical units. This is one of those identical units uh, as layout uh, that is used to could make masks, which are used to make the chips. If you compare this with what well, I'll show in the next slides uh, for a standard cell ASIC, you can see it's much more, much less regular than the standard cell ASIC. All we'll be dealing with largely in this course are standard cell-based ASICs or cell-based ICs. Sometimes we'll also refer to as semi-custom designs. In this type of design, a set of standard cells are designed by humans and inserted into a library. Here, there's typically uh, 50 to 100 plus standard cells in a library. Uh, here's two examples of standard cells. Uh, this is a D flip-flop. This is a layout view. And here's a layout view of an OR gate. What you see here uh, in the layout view are the, the transistors uh, and the metal wires connecting the transistors uh, to the power and grounds and to the external possible connections. So the idea is uh, you write register transfer language. The synthesis tool converts this into a set of standard cells. Then the standard cells are placed into rows and wire together using place and route tools. These thicker metal wires at the top and bottom of these two standard cells are the power and ground rails. You'll notice that these two standard cells are the same height, though the different width, and these power and ground rails would line up with each other. So by placing the standard cells into rows, you connect up all the power and grounds. And then what you have to do is route to the I.O. of the cells. Here's an example layout of a standard cell ASIC. Uh, you can see the rows are quite evident uh, in, in, this, uh, uh, in, in this ASIC. Uh, but there's a lot of wiring connecting up the standard cells. These two functions, in contrast, are most likely memories. Uh, we won't get into memory compilers. Uh, they're relatively straightforward to use. Uh, but the way they're designed is you, you, some are human designs RAM and ROM cells. Uh, and these are tiled together uh, to create larger functions. So an application-specific integrated circuit would consist of a number of rows of standard cells, some memories, you might have a CPU core in there. Uh, that CPU core it might, is typically supplied by someone else, and it might itself be implemented as standard cells. And sometimes you might have a custom data path, such as a specialized multiplier done in full custom, though this is increasingly rare. So the basic methodology is you write register transfer language, which will be a subject, large subject in this class. You synthesize that to a set of gates, and the gates are placed and routed across the, the uh, surface of the chip uh, to create a set of masks that then go to fabrication. Again, a full set of masks are, are still required. There's no functions uh, that are uh, unchanging uh, between different designs, except for the layout of the standard cells, but they're not built into uh, wafers until uh, wafer processing. Let's turn a little to some of the basics of chip fabrication. When I refer to a mask, I, I refer to a, a layer of the chip design that has a mask associated with it to guide its patterning. So here, for example, is an inverter. We have the uh, implants for the transistors. These are implanted uh, through processes defined by ma individual masks. So there, there'll be three masks associated with the, the uh, transistor uh, channels. Uh, 
uh, the source and drains and the channel, uh, P-type mask, an N-well mask and an N-type mask. Here you have the layout of the gates of the transistors, which itself is a separate mask. In this example, it's polysilicon, it's often metal today. And then you have the interconnect structures. Uh, yeah, here we see one layer of metal. Again, there'll be masks associated with this. And the black squares are vias that connect different layers together. So in this example, uh, the black vias connect the metal traces to the transistors. The masks are used in a modern, in a fab, uh, where wafers are run through the fab. Typical size today in advanced nose is 12 nanometers, a uh, correction, 12 inches or 300 millimeters. And the fabs are very highly automated. Uh, robotic handlers uh, ship the masks between different stations, which perform different functions in the many hundreds of steps uh, where they have to be executed uh, to uh, uh, get a, um, a wafer full of chips, which are then tested and diced up and packaged. Each of the masks are used to define uh, particular features in the chips and are used in a fashion similar to what's illustrated on this slide. What you typically do is coat the wafer with photoresist. You then introduce the mask above the photoresist and shine light through it. Uh, this hardens some of the photoresist, making it... Uh, uh, there's, different, there's different approaches, but one approach is to where the light shines, uh, the photoresist is, is more amenable to etching. You can then etch away the exposed parts of the photoresist. You can then do your patterning, in this case, uh, etch it into the silicon to make a, a, a via. And you then strip the developed photoresist away before going on to the next step. So you end up with a series of masks, uh, these days many tens of masks, uh, to define all the features, uh, such as the uh, implants for the wells, the vias, the metal layers, and so forth, that go into making a chip. This process uh, is called lithography. Um, over the uh, first few decades of the semiconductor industry, the wavelength used for lithography uh, was repeatedly shortened from 365 nanometers to 193 nanometers. Uh, 193 nanometers light is pretty much the, the shortest wavelengths that, that can be, uh, that are relatively short wavelengths and, and it wasn't possible to, sh to shrink the wavelength further. So for a long time, we used 193 nanometer light to define chips with smaller and smaller features on them. Today, uh, many fabs are introducing what's called extreme UV, where the light wavelength is 13 nanometers. This introduction of EUV is, is very powerful, because prior to that, um, most patterning was based on 193 nanometer wavelength lithography. By doing the uh, photo uh, uh, lithography in water, you can define features smaller than 133 nanometer. You can define features down to 40 nanometers. But beyond that, they had to use various tricks to get smaller features, such as what's called multiple patterning, edge patterning, and diffraction. Uh, EUV breaks through this bottleneck and will permit direct patterning of smaller features on the chip. And increasingly, fabs are turning to EUV as they go to more and more advanced nodes. Let's look briefly at one of these tricks uh, double patterning. So the idea is you want to use 193 wavelength, 193 nanometer wavelength light to define a set of wires uh, at uh, roughly a 50 nanometer pitch. One way to do that is to split the wires into two groups. One group that is patterned first to create these wires. And a second group that is pattern second to create these wires. Thus, together you get this the full set of wires at a 50 nanometer pitch. Uh, but it requires two sets of masks and two sets of complete processing uh, to 
get one layer of metal. So this is one reason that the cost of the chip fab is, is increasing substantially in the more advanced nodes. One way to get around the need for double patterning is to uh, use extreme UV light. Uh, There's 13 nanometer wavelength. One of the many difficulties with extreme UV light is you can't use lenses anymore. Uh, you have to use mirrors, uh, and uh, this leads to a lot of attenuation in the system, but it, these machines are, do exist. Uh, they are being employed in advanced fabs uh, and increasingly taking over uh, the fabrication of some of the layers. They're also very expensive, uh, which is another reason why uh, uh, transist cost per transistor stopped going down uh, once we went below, beyond 20 nanometers. So, uh, cell based, let's turn back to cell based ASICs. Uh, we, we talked, we defined these a moment ago. A set of standard cells is used to define a set of logic gates, which are placed and routed across the chip. Uh, this is a very common ASIC design style. Uh, most companies that do design cell based ASICs don't own a fab. The company does the design only, and the fab is performed by another company. Uh, for example, TSMC, uh, UMC, Global Semiconductors, or Intel. Uh, Samsung is another player in this realm. Um, th there are a couple of exceptions uh, the, the, of fabulous companies. Intel is the most glaring one. Uh, Samsung also comes to mind. That is, there are a few companies that own fabs and own the design process. But generally, these are separated. Companies like Qualcomm and Apple uh, and Google don't own a fab. Uh, they uh, do a design and then ship uh, and then get the fab to make the masks and do the processing. Sometimes this is increasingly rare. Uh, some of the back end, what's called the back end components of the design flow, such as place and route, might be performed at the fab company or with their assistants. Let's turn to some of the other ASIC styles. There are what are called gate array based ASICs. Uh, in a gate array, the transistor level masks are fully defined and don't change. Uh, so you, the, the uh, company prefabricates a set of transistors, a uh, set of wafers with transistors already defined. What the designer does is define some of the wiring layers and the vias to implement the desired function. Gate array designs are slower than cell-based designs, but are faster to implement uh, as you as most of the processing is complete in advance, that is defining the transistor layers. They still use RTL-based methods and synthesis. Uh, uh, so often the uh, RTL can be the same uh, as for a, a standard cell ASIC. Here's a couple of examples of gate array companies. Chip Express has a set of wafers which are prefabricated with a sea of uh, transistor macros and four metal layers. The customer defines two metal layers to customize the gate array for an application. So only four masks are needed to complete fabrication. So the fabrication can be done very quickly. Another example, Triad Semiconductor uh, and if you're familiar with North Carolina, you can guess where it is. Uh, they have a set of analog and digital macros and have only one metal layer for customization. Uh, so they can turn around chips with a two week notice uh, because uh, there's only one metal layer that has to be has to be patterned. Everything else is existing on a set of stockpiled wafers, which are pre-patterned the analog and digital macros. Now, gate arrays, um, are useful. They're often used in biomedical and other sensing applications. Um, they tend to be in legacy nodes and they uh, are not a, a, a fairly small portion of the industry right now. Another very common implementation style for ASICs are programmable logic devices, a subset of which are field programmable gate arrays. Here, there's no mask making at all. These are off-the-shelf integrated circuits 
that can be programmed by the user to capture the logic. No custom mask layers. So once you finish the design, you can, you can get it implemented on the FPGA in uh, actually in minutes. Uh, there, there is occasionally what's called simple PLDs. These are often just combinational logic. They're used for simple functions. We're not gonna be dealing with those. We are, will be dealing however with FPGAs, um, which are used for a lot of designs uh, where the FPGAs are, are, are suited. Um, they're capable of capturing uh, millions of gates, but not billions of gates. If you need a 100 million gate circuit or a billion gate circuit, you're stuck with using a standard cell design. Other limitations of FPJs are high power consumption and high per unit cost and slow speed. In general, in these factors, uh, for example, the speed and FPGA will be 10 to 100 times slower than the same function implemented in ASIC. The reason that FPGAs can be used to implement ASIC-like functions is because you have an array of what are called, in Xilinx terminology, uh, configurable logic blocks. So here is part of the FPGA layout. Uh, you have the CLBs which are interconnected by programmable switch matrices, so to define the, the interconnect. These are the sets of transmission gates that are turned on and off uh, to define the connections between the CLBs. Inside the CLBs themselves, there are small SRAMs, some MUXs, and some D flip-flops. The small SRAMs are used to implement combinational logic. You can implement any two-layer logic function in an SRAM. Uh, basically, you map the Kano map onto the SRAM. Uh, so here we have some four input, one output logic functions. They're implemented in these two uh, uh, logic blocks. Here's a third logic block. There are muxes that are set to steer the logic in a certain fashion, and the flip-flops. So the idea is you build a small function into each CLB. Though you then configure the programmable switch matrices to connect these up in certain fashions. And thus you can build a larger function across the entire FPGA. And this is done using a set of tools provided by the FPGA vendor. This is an example of some FPGAs. Uh, uh, one particular example, the Intel uh, Xilinx Vertex 6, uh, can theoretically implement up to 4.5 million gates. I say theoretically because this is the calculation if you uh, maximize the use of the CLBs and maximize the number of gates mapped into each logic function. So it's a theoretical map limit that's never actually achieved because you can't use an FPGA with 100% uh, with density. But you know you still can practically uh, likely to get a million plus gates, and this is twelve hundred dollars per part. This is sort of a mid-range FPGA, a high-end FPGA example is the Xilinx Ultra Scale, which can theoretically implement up to about twenty-six million gates. But again, uh, that's a theoretical limit. Um, but in practicality, you can probably get. 10 million gates or so onto an ultra scale FPGA. These are relatively expensive, about $7,000 per part. Not shown in this table are smaller FPGAs that might only be able to implement tens of thousands of logic gates. They can be as low as about $12 each. We'll come back to this in a moment, but I want to emphasize that standard cell A6 uh, are much cheaper per part, uh, uh, as little as 10 cents per part. Really big ones might be $100 per part. I do want to note, this is the cost to the design company, not the street price. So I'm not getting this off Amazon. I'm getting this from a typical fab cost uh, for our fab customers. So we'll get back to this, but you can see FPGAs are modestly capable. and can be quite expensive at the high end, whereas standard cell ASICs 
uh, can be uh, uh, quite cheap and, and very, very capable. I, I, I'm doing here what is common in this industry, and that is uh, even though an FPGA is a type of ASIC, quite often the term ASIC is used for standard cell ASIC, and FPGA is used for a full programmable ASIC. Let's get into comparing FPGAs and standard cell ASICs and gate arrays in a little more detail. Let's look at the pros and cons of a standard cell ASIC versus an FPGA. The standard cell ASIC will have a faster clock, possibly much faster, but much lower power consumption, possibly a lot lower. And you can build billions of logic gates into a chip versus only millions for an FPGA, and that's a high-end FPGA. The cost per part is going to be low as long as the volume is large enough. Why do I say large volumes? Because you need to run a set of wafers through a fab to get the FPGAs. So the minimum purchase is a whole bunch of wafers, uh, which you know, can be hundreds or thousands, tens of thousands or millions of parts. Uh, so you know, a, a fab isn't used to run one wafer at a time and then switch to a wafer from a different product. Uh, the, the fabs want to uh, run lots of wafers from the same product through in one batch before turning to a different product. So the uh, so standard cell A6s are generally fabricated in large volumes. Some of the cons of a standard cell ASIC, you have a complex design flow. It takes a long time to get the chips back from the fab because you have to have a full set of masks. The design costs are high because uh, you need a complex design flow and you need to spend much more effort in verification because you can't afford to, uh, you can't afford to have multiple cycles of fab uh, as you debug the parts. The cost of making the masks is high, then the cost of getting the uh, first set of wafers from the fab is about the same. You have expensive CAD tools that you have to buy and own and maintain. And you don't have a lot of flexibility. If you want to revise the product, uh, that is update the product, you have to go through a significant redesign effort. So there's not a lot of agility in uh, standard cell ASIC parts. Let's look at this from the flip side. What are the advantages and disadvantages of FPGAs versus standard cell ASICs? One of the big advantages is you get the first parts ready to, to test in minutes after the design is complete. You write the RTL, you compile it, you upload it to the FPGA and it's ready for testing. The CAD tools are usually free. You can design FPGAs in your office, in your, in your, at your desk at home. All you need is the free software from the FPGA vendor, and we'll be dealing with that later in the class, uh, and some sort of board to program the FPGA, which you can buy for under $50. Because the parts are ready for testing so quickly, you spend much less effort in verification. You can actually test the part as it's running rather than do lots of simulations. So there's a lot lower cost per gate to design, and see a lot of flexibility. If you want a new version of your chip, you could do it within a day, uh, recoding the RTL, making sure it's exercising some bugs out of it uh, as needed, and then uh, compiling it to the FPGA. Whereas the standard cell ASIC would take uh, months to redesign. Some of the cons, you're limited to relatively small designs, depending on the FPGA family you're using. The clock frequency and the power consumption is a lot worse. And the cost per part does not get any benefit from high volume manufacturing. Those example prices I had a few pages ago don't scale down much if you buy FPGAs in higher volumes. Gate arrays are sort of somewhere in between, uh, but, they're really, uh, but they're really mixed signal parts. Their niche is when you need some analog functions as well as digital functions such as analog digital converters. Uh, and they're kind of set, suited only to small sets of applications. Again, biomedical sensing is actually a fairly common application for gate arrays. Like the FPGA, they're relatively simple to design, 
You don't get the parts back in minutes, but you get them back in, the, in days or weeks uh, versus months for standard cell ASICs. They can achieve relatively modest performance and power. Uh, they tend to be implemented in legacy nodes. Uh, you, you, you can't buy a, a, a 7 nanometer uh, uh, gate array that I'm aware of. And, and they're cost effective in modest volumes. Let's talk a little bit about cost before giving some examples. There's two types of costs generally in chip engineering, non-recurring and recurring costs. Non-recurring costs are one-time costs design, associated with designing the part. Recurring costs are the per-part costs. Examples of non-recurring costs include the uh, cost of the engineers, that is, you and your future, the CAD tools, office space, etc. And you know, this has to be recovered, so you divide by the volume the number of chips you're making to get the cost per part. The recurring costs in a standard cell ASIC are the full cost of uh, mask making, wafer costs, tests and packaging. In the FPGA is the purchase price per part and the price of, of, of any testing. So here's an example. Let's say we have a modest ASIC, one million gate design. An FPGA might cost around 100K to do the design this is mainly engineering time. And $500 per part to actually uh, build. Now, this is largely the purchase price from the FPGA vendor, often through a distributor. The standard cell ASIC might cost 10 times more to design. But this small and ASIC is probably around 10 cents per part uh, in high volume. So when is the standard cell ASIC cheaper than the FPGA? Well, this is straightforward algebra. Uh, you, you sum up the NRE divided by the number of units plus the cost per unit times the number of units. You compare that with the uh, FPGA cost and the standard cell ASIC is cheaper when you have greater than 1,800 units. And, and this might be a fairly typical answer. Um, no, standard cell designs are uh, fairly, uh, um, are very, are very uh, cost effective uh, in, in volume. Let's look at a couple of other scenarios. Let's look at the low volume part. Let's say you're only making 200 units of this million gate design. We can see from this equation up above that as long as the power and sp clock speed is not critical, the FPJ would be cheaper. So that would be the route you would go because the volume is so modest. In contrast, if you're building a billion logic gate design, there's no FPGA that this will fit into, so a standard cell ASIC is your only choice. Or let's say you're building a design where the power or the performance is very critical. Uh, examples might be uh, 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 cell phone processors, where obviously the power consumption is very critical because of battery life. Uh, another example might be uh, uh, AI accelerators, uh, where you want uh, very high levels of performance. In these examples, the standard cell ASIC is your only choice. Here's another example of a calculation. Uh, this came from Express Array. Here we're, com we're calculating the average selling price versus volume for three different implementations, middle in a legacy node and 180 nanometer CMOS where the FPGA, which benefits little from volume, so the price uh, doesn't go down much with volume. You have the standard cell ASIC, and you have the gate array. And you see as expected, the gate array is more cost effective than the standard cell ASIC until the standard cell ASIC hits a fairly high volumes. Now, this is, this is an example in a legacy node because that's what these gate arrays are available in. Uh, um, and, and, and this is just an example. Don't take this as, a, as the, the preordained trade-off graph for this question uh, for any and all parts. So some comments before we finish off this module. The market is dominated 
by standard cell ASICs and FPGAs. Uh, and in general, uh, the, the standard cell designs are used for higher volume applications that justify the NRE, or sometimes they're even used for low volume applications where the power or performance is very critical. Many do consider FPGAs as being separate from ASICs. The, the reason is there's a very different level of design skills required. Uh, uh, ASICs require complex tools with specialized engineers to run them. FPGAs, you download the tools from the vendor and you don't need a lot of specialized knowledge to run them. In standard cell ASICs, you have to do a lot of verification before sending the part to the factory, which again, increases the uh, sophistication required of the team. In contrast for an FPGA, you don't need to do verification. Uh, so the team has to be less, it can be less sophisticated in that regard. There's the barrier of entry to FPGA design is very low. Uh, again, the tools are often are free typically. Uh, so versus you know, spending millions of dollars on CAD tools for standard cell ASIC, you spend zero on CAD tool ACE designs, CAD tools for FPGAs. And FPGAs have much lower performance levels than ASICs, so there's not as much performance tuning in the design flow. However, and I want to emphasize that, this for the purpose of this class, the, the actual front end design, there's the RTL coding, is virtually identical in an FPGA as in a standard cell ASIC. It is true that you can tune the design to FPGAs, if that's your implementation style. Um, and we'll get to this in a later module in this class. But you're still writing RTL. And you're still using logic synthesis. Uh, and uh, so the, the front end of the design, as we call it, uh, stays much the same. So that brings us to the end of the sub-module. We talked about the different styles of ASICs. Full custom, where every chip is every transistor is designed, which is relatively rare. Standard cell design, in which a set of standard cells are placed and routed across the chip to define a full set of masks. Gate arrays, where the number of customizable masks is much reduced over a standard cell design. And field programmable gate arrays, which are chips you buy, which are programmed on the fly using lookup tables for logic and programmable switch matrices for connections. And I'll finish off with this uh, uh, table summary, uh, doing a qualitative comparison of uh, custom design, standard cell design, and gate arrays and FPGAs, basically summarizing the factors that we went through uh, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, last few pages. That's the end of the section. I encourage you to the sub-module quiz before turning to the next sub-module, um, which will uh, uh, get into uh, an example of an ASIC product before we turn to the ASIC design flow. Thank you very much for your time and your attention.